ratio. Um, I used to know the statistic on how many people represent uh, the NSDF. I believe it's, I have a feeling it was over a million that were actually involved in the federation itself. Um, and it has been transferred to different, to Puna, Puna? Yeah. Um, up and along the, the, uh, the western coast of India. But more importantly, what's really interesting is that members of Mahila Milan and the RSDF have actually gone to Uganda, to Kenya, to Colombia, and this, and this type of federation type approach actually has been replicated. Um, I'd like to ask, when the communities were moved, were those fairly um, homogenous communities in terms of being Hindu Muslim or different castes or different <coughs> groups? The issue, that's an excellent question now. The issue of caste and religion are two issues that I specifically avoided in order to, <laughs> that can possibly open an entire can of worms in terms of social conflict or uh, that sort of thing. So I, I specifically did not address that. Yeah, I was curious whether this project has the potential to be, or has actually served as the scaling wheels for the Tanami project itself. Because it seems to me that this was done on a much modest, modest scale, the resettlement of 60,000 people as compared to what Dharavi is, which is a huge reset of people. And some of the concerns that were raised uh, in the planning of the Dharavi project was how are these people going to be resettled into different environments, into different uh, housing types, and how are they going to integrate into these new environments? Uh, you know, your example of, of the uh, you know, access to water and other facilities and the residents' reaction to that. I was wondering if, if these kind of lessons were either uh, picked up by the diary planners, uh, or is there a potential for... To an extent, some of the populations um, that were resettled do actually reside in, in that army, and there were permanent housing apartments that were constructed there that within this project itself. The size of that army, given that it's a million people, puts it on a completely different scale of undertaking uh, I'm and not sure whether anyone mistake, saw... Mistakes could be on a gigantic scale too, that's why I was uh, just wondering. Well, precisely. Well, did anyone see this, this article in the, in the Economist? It was uh, just two weeks ago, Maximum City Blues. Please have a look online. Uh, it, it's only two weeks old, it's in the Economist. It's an excellent case in which the Darabi example is, is, is thoroughly referenced. And it actually says, there's an interesting statistic here that uh, so far in Darabi, uh, 500,000 slum dwellers have been resettled, but 2 million new ones have arrived. <laughs> <laughs> so the question is not how to continue to house existing slum dwellers, or scholars, I should say, but the new, new ones which are coming in. If there was a way to address the new ones coming in, it would be half of that. The issue of rural urban migration is, is what I think is largely driving your question. And there in not only India, but in many different countries, there's been the, the push by local governments or by state governments to expel migrants. If we go back to the, my very beginning, that slide that's showing your bed, it's a possibility. We cannot stop people from moving to the economic hubs, such as Mumbai. And in my mind, it's a question of, of looking at city spaces in a different way and trying to accommodate whether it's building up such as I guess. Uh, there's no around the Yeah, I think that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And I mentioned that the community actually assisted to arrange that that land be filled so that you wouldn't experience possibly the sinking. In terms of malaria, excellent point. I'm not sure that the risk of 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 the proximity of the existing slum, right? Is that almost impossible in many cases? You can see the Kutsi bike road, which is all along the way line check. There is no land in the Because of the density of the population, absolutely. And this is one of the biggest challenges that now, even the legislation that sounds good, 
is not always implemented. And this is very much the fact that there were demolitions and evictions since this research completely supports that. Um, now, with with the reorganization of Mumbai, uh, the consulting, international consulting firm McKinsey um, recently, not recently, a few years ago, did a, an interesting project um, to assess how Mumbai could reshape itself, invest in itself, to become comparable to Shanghai. And it was going to take, I think, $1.2 billion. Um, and it involves, you know, over uh, uh, a flyway overpasses to, to take traffic up. Uh, and these are all things that are being looked at. The feasibility of it, I agree, is very challenging. Um, just a brief question. The, the jump in which you gave in this film and project, um, how many kilometers distance they were moved? And uh, what kind of mitigation is going to do? In terms of opening the schools, the schools are those people in terms of providing bus passes, train passes to go downtown where they used to work in that school. On your first point of how far? It varied. Uh, if I can go back to the slide, it definitely varied for individuals. Uh, while some individuals from Kurla had to re resettle to Kangaroo Market, others in Dharavi were settled in the same area. Uh, same area here. So it was extremely dependent on, on a case specific itself. On the issue of uh, mitigating factors for transportation, for economic uh, continuity, I can answer a very simple word now. There were no uh, measures taken to facilitate their movement. And this is something that, that holds with urban resettlement globally. Is that when you remove the people from their, from, from the space where they have formed their livelihoods, it, it, it tears them apart. Then in the how much will it cost in terms of years of For? Getting the train tickets, train passes, the news. Not that I've heard, that I've seen. That certainly does not mean that there's that, that type of. Uh, Estimate has not been done in the course of my research in Europe. And I think on the schools issue, uh, the nurseries were very much, that, that were, not, were, not, were very much a local issue. Um, because understanding the older children would have to continue further to, to their schools, which often implied that mothers and, and usually mothers would have to go and they would sometimes need one hour to, to come out of their children's schools. So um, I'm sure those, those types of negative factors were, I would say, made much kind of. Any questions, Matt? I think you could place a question. Eight people living there. And she pointed to her TV and she smiled. 
and she just wanted to show me where she lived when she had to. Very, very open, welcoming. Um, the second story is that um, I was staying with, with, a, with a gentleman, and I think he, he like you mentioned, know, a luxury on Narvan Point, overlooking the bay, absolutely gorgeous. I think he thought I was crazy to be going out into you know, these slums. And uh, I come back and I said, well, what, what, what are you eating during the day? That's not even like what I want. Aren't you afraid of getting sick? Well, if you're not getting sick, then I'm sure it'll be okay for me. I never had any problem until I went to a five-star restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> so, so my human experience was incredibly motivating to, to see these people, to see how, how genuinely warm they were, uh, how much thought and effort had gone into this. And the other thing I'll say is that I met the president of the National Song Laws Federation. This is a gentleman who now has met Prince Charles, he met Kofi, and now he's a celebrity in India, and he's treated with such revere and respect from the slum dwellers themselves, because he is one of them, that it provides an inspiration that this, this type of work can be replicated, but it does require that, that charismatic leader to really give that, that kickstart it needs. So I was incredibly inspired by it, and, and, and I hope that I've, I've expressed that through pictures and words. I think uh, when I joined the Sumatra, I'm a teacher. My question is, you said that the government is still credit. I was wondering uh, to what extent they're politically honest. The reason why I said the question is, you said they're going to do what you want to What kind of role they will be playing in determining policies and other laws? Because you know, somebody else is deciding their fate from the whole now. I wonder if we come to a time that these people will be very actively involved on policy making the world so that they can play part in the role in the development process itself, eventually. Uh, do you see that happening? Yes, and uh, perhaps I should clarify that there was certainly participation of the Mahila Man and the RSA in determining this system. So they actually managed to, to, uh, to help hold the resettlement of the sun destiny and the resettlement policy. Uh, they were very much involved in the process. Um, and not at a national level, not at a national level. I think that's what I was through the questions. That's a localized case. Um, in terms of, of, of uh, political engagement and so forth, leaders of the housing societies and the RCF cannot be politically active. They cannot use those organizations as a platform on which to campaign. And this was done extremely intentionally in order to keep it grounded in actually what mattered. So there's definitely a division of extremely intentional. Yeah. 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 So I think something has to be done about that because I know the party example of the world and they made a good set of friends. But they said the world and the friends were wanted. And they went back. They were already there. Plus, they were already there. Absolutely. And this is not an issue of urban development or that active practitioners and professionals are family on a daily basis. For example, I read one. And in Puna, the language is supposed to be a party. The party environment, the so many people have come from other provinces. What I think is important also to realize though is that, especially in the case of Mabadi, um, and this does hold in many other countries, is that people who live in the slums may not actually be poor. Yeah, oh yeah. They might think they're doctors who live in the lawyers who live And it, it could be a question of personal economic jumps or on availability of housing. Um, and, and that's what I didn't make during the presentation, but I think it's important to underscore. So, houses that sort of expect to sound stress out, houses, those lower economic uh, stratas that we're talking about, uh, whereas those who came to the city with skills are able to make a transition of the household easier. Yeah, uh, like you, you did ask what I mean about you know, like I was told that the feeling is not necessary and she wanted that, but when we came in, uh, when we went to India, we saw some of those stuff. And he wanted to see a slums, so he went there and he came back. He said, the guy's got a scooter, a TV, it was totally not his idea for some, he was, and he got the latest, uh, you know, his gadgets and everything. So he says, why are they getting there? And I said, because they get free water and electricity. Uh, that really horrifying, but... If, if I can put a discussion on the table, if, if I've not heard of it, the uh, focus that we have is that it's an excellent read about the economy of, of the slum. People that make it at work, these chapters generally get to increase more so. It's an excellent book to get about the chapters.
Thank you for making this. Happen. 